And we just are thrilled to be connected. We are so glad for the life that we receive from you is an everlasting life. It's an unending life. It's a life full of healing and strength, of encouragement and wisdom, of joy and peace. Lord, I thank you that, God, that we just by faith through our living union with you, Father God, could draw out of that life, the life of Jesus, all that is needed spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, in every realm. We love you tonight, Father. Is that right, church? Come on, we lift our hands. We reverence you, Father. We love you. We glorify you. We magnify you, Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. We worship you. We reverence you. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Well, come on, many of us, we've been working all day. We've been active all day. Hallelujah. God, we just love you and we worship you. We press into you right now. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Father, we hunger and we thirst for you. We hunger and we thirst for righteousness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We've come to drink from the river of life tonight. Ha, glory to God. We've come to eat from the fruit of the tree of life. Hallelujah. We came with a bucket. It's got joy on the bucket. It's a bucket of joy. And with joy, we draw out from the well of our salvation. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise God, praise God. Glory, glory, glory. Glory to God. Come on, just lift up your voice and pray in other tongues if you can. Glory to God. Landi andong go re baba bata andong go re baba shande. Mandong go sa papande. Mankon do salama. Eko to sanda. Mato konda sa. Aha. Mandi andong go re baba bata yande. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Where's Gabrielle? Is she here? I don't see her yet tonight. Praise God. Well, I was going to minister to her. Okay. Praise God. Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Praise God. Uh, Miss Melissa, do you think you could try to give me a little bit more on my mic? That'd be awesome. Praise God. Good to see you, everybody. Hallelujah. You excited to be in God's presence tonight? Glory to God. I'm excited to be here and I'm ready to minister to you with the Lord's help. So good to see all of you tonight. Uh, people that have traveled, our youth that have come, visitors that are here, visitors that are back. So glad to see you tonight. We're going to move to just a time of just greeting and visitation. Take two or three minutes. Say hi. Or as in Oklahoma, you may say howdy. Y'all say howdy here. Yeah. That's big in Oklahoma, howdy. Anyway, however you do it, greet one another. We'll let the praise team come down. We'll come back. We'll resume the service. Praise God.
Welcome, welcome, welcome to those in the house and outside the house. Praise God. So good to see everybody. Hope everybody had a good day. Hey, would you guys, if you have an inroad with God, and I know you do, ask Him to turn the faucet off. Man. I mean, I think it's contributed to my mood in a negative way. So I am ready for it to dry out in the natural. <laughs> Not in the spirit, but in the natural. So, Anyway, God bless you. Good to see everyone, especially those of you visiting the church tonight. Uh, you know, we're in that time of year where it's going to be uh, a walk of faith to get the thermostat right, you know, for everybody. So if it's cool right now, just hang on. You'll be hot in a minute. All right. <laughs> and uh, we'll try to make everybody as comfortable as we can. So good to see everyone. If you were not able to be with us in church on Sunday morning, if you would go ahead and record your attendance with us, uh, the fastest, easiest way to do that is to just open up the attendance tab on our mobile app and just click that you are here. And uh, if not, go ahead and grab a green attendance card, fill that out, drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by in just a little while, just a minute and uh, get your attendance recorded uh, for the week. Praise God. Well, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ again. And of course, here we endeavor to preach the resurrection. Christ and Him crucified, raised from the dead every Sunday in some form, every service. But we're going to do that. And we're believing for it to be an evangelistic meeting. Amen. So, uh, you know, if you're uh, saved and right and on fire with God, you're, you're not my aim. Right. Come to church, God will have something for you, but this service is aim we're aiming at people who are out of fellowship with 750 of these, and we have about another 500 in a different format, and we would love for you to uh, grab some of these. If you live on a cul-de-sac, if you live uh, in an apartment complex, if you live in a neighborhood of some type, and you would be willing, count up in your head how many houses that is, amen, grab a door hanger for each, and Friday or Saturday put one of these on their door hanger or hand it to the guy while he's mowing his grass if it's dry enough, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but be an inviter. Amen. Be an inviter. But uh, we also want and, and are going to invite uh, anytime you could Thursday, Thursday evening. Of course, we have mentoring Thursday evening for those that come to that. Uh, but Friday, Saturday, if you want to get together in groups of two, three, and four and ask my office about a neighborhood, an area, uh, that, that we might want you to target, that you could go out and spend an hour and, and pass out a couple hundred of these, okay? And uh, we really want you to respond. But anyway, uh, you could pick up uh, the number of door hangers that you know that you'll hand out. Uh, they're on the Chris Cody Ministries table out there, just like this. And so go out, don't waste them, but go pick them up and pass them out. Amen. 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 And then contact us uh, by Facebook here in the office after church, my assistant Brett. Uh, and let us know that you'd like to be uh, uh, on one of those teams that goes out and uh, knocks. You don't have to knock on the door. You just even just put it on the windshield or whatever you got to do. It'd be nice and easy. And we're believing for supernatural fruit uh, to come forth in that. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to keep the Easter egg thing for the kids and the candy deal uh, on course. Uh, you know, with the weather as best we can, we'll let you know. If not, we'll just be giving out a bunch of free candy. <laughs> That's what we're going to be doing anyway. We're going to make them work for it. But anyway, uh, but light up your Facebook, light up your, uh, you know, text messages. Let's fill the house. Let's have a great time uh, on Sunday morning. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, uh, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, as we get ready to uh, minister and uh, work a spiritual law, praise God. And uh, I just want to use this scripture and then give you a little testimony, praise God, about how this law is working for my wife and I. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It'll work for anybody who works it. Amen. Anybody that's got faith enough to pull the trigger on this law of seed time and harvest. Yeah. And uh, so here I've got my Amplified Bible out. We'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. It says, remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will reap that way. If I could put my own word in there. 
will reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to someone. See, that's the motive of a good seed, right? That the motivation behind it is that a blessing may come to someone. That person will reap generously and with blessings. Amen. I've just been noticing something uh, of late. Uh, I'm in charge. I have authority along with my wife over several accounts, personal, ministerial, so forth and so on. One of them is my Chris Cody Ministries uh, account, which is where my partnership money comes in. Uh, mentoring money comes into that to help me travel, to help me print books, to help me go on missions trips, that kind of thing. Amen? And uh, so, but uh, I've just purposed where I can to sow out of that account. Amen. Amen. Like I try to do in all of my accounts, because I know that whatever I sow will be multiplied. Goes on and says in another verse here that in verse, God is able, right? He'll multiply. And we get to do it first class. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what I did? I ran over to someone I vaguely knew, and I said, I, he had his earphones on to work, and I said, hey, hey, hey. I said, I figure you're someone that would appreciate this. I needed someone to rejoice with. I said, God just, I've been sowing seed, and God had answered my prayer. I just got a $2,400 harvest. He goes, wow, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you're smart, you're going to sow some sort of seed out of every barn, every can, every account, yeah. e everything you can. Get that law working for you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, that doesn't work because I'm special. It doesn't work because I'm a preacher. Mm -hmm. It just worked because I sowed seed in, out of that barn so that blessings could come to somebody. Amen. And blessing came back to that account in multiplied fashion. Yes. So that just really furthers us in other things that we've got slated and that we're committed to do this year. Right. And, you know, in light of that, you know what I decided? I decided, you know what, this is working. I'm going to sow $150. I'm going to grab one of these envelopes that really belongs to one of our families. But I took one and I put transfer $150 out of Chris Cody Ministries to our building deal. Because I know this thing's working. Yes. And I know World Harvest Church is good ground to sow into. Amen. Amen. Ushers, if you want to come, praise God, please do get ready to serve the people. Don't forget, we've got quite a few uh, of these envelopes up here. And what we're doing with these is we're asking every family that, you know, I've taught you faith, right? And you ought to be able to use your faith. Put this on something that you see, your dashboard, your refrigerator, and just walk by and ask God... One time, Father, I want $150 of seed to sow into this building project, above and beyond my tithe. Amen. And I'm believing you to fill that envelope to give seed to the sower. Amen. That's all I'm asking you to do. Every one of you ought to run up here and get one. If you don't have one, you ought to be able to enough, have enough faith to ask God to give you seed to sow into His work. He's going to be highly motivated to do that. Amen. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, don't forget that we do support uh, in part with other churches, other ministries, the orphanage in India. I got to say hi to Pastor David today. Kamal, when we met for breakfast, was on the phone with Pastor David Raju. And uh, so got to say hi to him. And they're coming to the U.S. again in May, right? And we will get to see them. Is that right? That's exciting. Praise God. Well, get your uh, envelope ready. Get your offering ready, your tithe ready. Let's blow this thing out. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we just come in the mighty name of Jesus. And I just so thank you for stirring faith in the, on the inside. Faith we've already got in our spirit because we've heard the word preached about uh, giving and tithing and uh, sowing seed and reaping harvests. And Father, that we're acting on that because faith is an action. Faith is an action. Faith is an action. God, I pray that people will get that like they've never got it before, that faith always has movement with it, and that God climbs up in that movement and gets involved. Father, I'm asking you, as the people are giving and tithing tonight, to get uh, really involved in their personal finances. Cancel debts, give them wisdom, supernatural favor, harvest on their seed, 
Fill their barn with plenty. Cause their vats to overflow with new wine. Satan, we take authority over you. We know you're the hinderer. We command you to cease and desist in all your hindering activity against our businesses, our finances, our families, our ministries. Now, ministering spirits that are assigned to us, Hebrews 1.14, go forth right now and cause the blessings to be made manifest. Cause the money to come to us. And Father, we pledge we're going to do the right thing with the harvest when it comes. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, be blessed as you give tonight. Ephesians chapter 6, if you've been with us the last two weeks on these Wednesday night services, you know that the Lord has had us emphasizing the subject of prayer. And uh, I'm still, well not just still, but even more so, uh, stirred about it in my own heart. And uh, so we've been, uh, I just went ahead and titled it as a series called How to Turn Things. Is there any situation in your life that's not going the exact right direction that you might need to turn? <laughs> you know, situations uh, can be turned if we'll learn how to turn them. Now, depending on how many other wills are involved, how many other humans are involved, you know, other people, they have, they have something to say about what they do. Right, But you know, the things, the closer that things come to me and that affect me, my life, my wife, my children, my spiritual children, this ministry, anyone connected with me, the more closely connected they are, the more authority I have, the more ability I have in God to turn that situation. I had a lady, a young lady get offended with me a few years ago and leave the church. And uh, not the first time, won't be the last, and I'm not mad at her. But it's funny, within 24 hours of their having left the church, she having left the church, uh, she messaged me and asked me to pray for her. <laughs> the last correspondence I had with her is, I don't like you, and I don't like your church, and I'm leaving. 24 hours later, she's in a crisis and wanting me to pray for her. Now, what would love do? What my, I'll tell you what my flesh wanted to do. My flesh wanted to just say, you know, call that new guy you left me for. Of course, they didn't even have a new guy. Just out in the wilderness. Anyway, but love would say, of course. But... I said, now, I am going to pray for you with all, in all earnestness about this. But I want you to know, you disconnected from me. You told me I'm not your pastor. And I don't have the voice in your life I did 24 hours ago. I don't have the uh, authority in your life, spiritually, that I had 24 hours ago. And you don't act like you're giving that back to me. And she, you talk about mad. She got madder than a, oh, what you want to call that? I mean, she's mad then. But you know, I still prayed for her. I don't know how it turned out. Amen. But my point is, hallelujah, that, you know, you can't, your prayer life's not meant to control anybody. You understand that, right? And your prayer life is not meant 
nor is it designed to change someone else's will. Do you know God won't even change another person's will? Amen? But we can make power available to them. We can so saturate that situation in prayer that we can make it real hard for them to go the wrong way and a lot easier for them to go the right way. And if we could do that, and we can, we should. I'm out ahead of myself here. Amen. But I'm telling you, you ought to just assume that you and God laboring together in the Spirit, that if there's something that's needing to be turned, you can turn it. You and God. You can turn that situation. You can turn a situation of sickness to health, of defeat to victory, right? Of trial and test and pressure into triumph and victory and joy. Amen? Amen. Not doing that is by not praying, being prayerless, is costing us. So much. And if you've listened to the last couple of sermons, I've talked about prayerlessness and the cost of that. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10 again, says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Come on. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemings, the strategies of the devil. For we wrestle not. Come on, we got to get that and don't forget it. You know when people are acting up, it's so tempting to label them the problem. Right? But they're not the problem. I don't have the time to go run through that list, but they're not your problem. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in heavenly or high places. The Greek here is heavenlies. The Bible talks about there's one, more than one heaven. Paul said, I was caught up to the third heaven. That's the realm where God resides. But you know, right above us, in this unseen realm, in what I call the atmospheric heavens, in the unseen realm, that's where Satan resides. He's, it's not like the cartoons that I used to watch. You know, where they had the devil in a, had a long tail with a point on the end, had his little fiery pitchfork, and he's down in the flames of hell. That's where he resides. He don't want to go there. He's not hanging out there. He's the prince of the power of the air. And we need to get a clue about these forces that are arrayed against us. Amen. And we need to learn that there is a wrestling. Now, when I say that, I always want to remind you that we're wrestling and engaging the enemy from a victorious position, not a fighting position as if we're on equal ground with the devil. Jesus, in His death, burial, and resurrection, vanquished the enemy. Colossians tells us in chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus disarmed principalities and powers, and He made an open show of them in His triumphant work on the cross. Well, why why are they even an issue? Because they're loose. They're defeated, but they are loose. They're free and they're roaming around. And again, I asked you last week, how does a defeated foe, amen, gain victory over a triumphant church because that's happening a defeated vanquished foe in so many believers lives have the upper hand and are winning out over a victorious blood bought redeemed elevated seated church how is that possible well there's a few important reasons number one ignorant ignorance The victorious ones don't know they're victorious. But then another big reason is uh, victorious ones who know they're victorious don't show up for the fight. They don't ever step into the arena or they're not showing up there enough 
And if the enemy, though defeated by Jesus, is the only one in the arena, then the referee at the end of the contest has no choice but to raise his hand in victory because you didn't show up to battle. And God dealt with me about this last year, about the church. He said, your, Chris, your authority over the enemy and his opposition against my plan for your ministry is absolute. But his opposition is so intense and set and steady and constant against you, the opposition that you're bringing to that is not enough. Right. That's why the progress was so seemingly slow. Amen. So I, what do I do? He said, st I'm going to have to get more people praying. And here's where I want to go if I can tonight. Amen. He didn't say, I wasn't praying enough. He said, I've got to get more people that are connected with me in this fight. Now, I just want you to hold that for a moment. We're coming back to that thought. That's a predominant thought for tonight's emphasis. But remember, he says here, we don't wrestle, but we've got to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against. Then he describes all the pieces of the armor, right? Let's pick it up in verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then the first two words, amen, of verse 18 is praying always. Now, for review's sake, you remember praying always, that's not another part of the armor. Having got all the pieces of the armor on, you step into the arena, you engage in battle. The arena is prayer. Prayer is the arena we do our wrestling. Prayer is the arena, the battlefield on which we engage the enemy who is attempting to thwart your victory, thwart your family. Amen? Divide and conquer your marriage. Keep you broke, keep you sick, keep you defeated, keep your ministry from rising, keep your business from rising to keep your blessing from you. Amen. Prayer has a role. I'm not saying it's everything, but prayer has a huge role, amen, in the momentum of your life uh, going the right way. Hallelujah. You know, to picture this, uh, if you want to go ahead and put up that picture I, I asked you, so much of the time in, the, uh, uh, in prayer and in the Spirit, there is, this, uh, there is this battle and there is this contention. And you can see here, let's say the one that's overweighted, the one that's down is obviously overweighted, that that's, that represents the enemy's advantage over your life. That represents the enemy's constant, vigilant coming against your life. You have to tip those scales the other direction. And when you live prayerless, your spiritual life looks like this, and the devil's got you weighted down. Right. Not, because he's can over, not because he's victorious, but because huh, he's the only one fighting. Yeah. Amen? But see, as you pray, and as you engage, and as you use your faith, and as you stand against Him, and as you use the sword of the Spirit, and as you quench fiery darts with your shield of faith, and as you have your helmet of salvation on, which is, I know, I know, I know that I'm saved, and that I'm born again, I have all these privileges. Amen. I've got my breastplate, right? And you're engaged in that, then over time you can change the momentum. You can change, haven't, can't you sense that sometimes in your life there's, there's positive momentum, or man, you're facing some strong headwinds in your life. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you don't change momentum with a single action. Right? right. right. You ever watch the stock market? And you ever watch like the market, like it's done it in the last few weeks? You know, there'll be a momentum in the selling direction, in the negative direction, and man, the, the negative headwinds. And if you're wanting to buy in that moment, you can buy, but if you're wanting things to go up, you're facing momentum that is carrying that whole market that other way. Right. Event, you've got to wait till that momentum fizzles, and then see, then there's got to be a building, and a building, and a momentum that swings that thing the other way. Right. Your prayer life is like that. 
What kind of momentum is being brought by you to the things that pertain to you, to the things that you need to turn? What kind of momentum is there in the Spirit? Or is it just void? Is it just absent? Because you're not praying. By saying you're not praying, I'm not endeavoring to condemn anyone, but I want you to be able to see real clear what the lack of prayer is costing you. Hallelujah. Amen. Think about this. You know, we're not going to go there, I don't think, but in Exodus 17, we have Moses taking up a position on the mount of prayer. He's brought Aaron and her with him. Joshua has taken the army and has engaged the Amalekites in battle. Right? So let's, let's, let's assign as a type and a shadow Joshua and the, the army of Israel to your situation that you need to win in. Okay? And the Amalekites, as representative of the demonic forces arrayed against you, trying to stop that victory from consummating, coming to pass. We know what happens during this battle, right? As long as Moses has his hands lifted up, which is, right, engaged in worship and in a prayer mode, as long as that's happening... The tide of victory is with Israel. But when his hands grew tired, and he immediately, it says, when he began to lower his hands, backing off, if you will, symbolically from the prayer mode, immediately the momentum begins to shift. And the Amalekites, the demonic foes, begin to get the upper hand. Come on, do you see that? So they, they took measures. They got a stone. They, they got Moses perched up and Aaron on one side and her on the other. And they, 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 they were together. Come on. Oh, they helped me. The man of God was not alone on that hill. Now Moses is the focus there, but he could not have made it by himself. Oh, thank you, Father. The, the man of God needed the supply of those close to him. Because as strong as he was, he wasn't strong enough to keep his own hands up in prayer long enough to get the battle won. He needed, he needed, he needed, come on, the supply of those that he was serving. And those that were called alongside him. Go to just a few pages to the right to Philippians chapter 1. Woo, I got revelation right there. Thank you, Father. Praise God. I want you to ask yourself, what is connected to my prayer life? Amen. Not in a condemning way or a beating up way, but a motivating way, a self-examining way, a sobering way. Amen. We're all in different seasons, right? We all have different demands. We all have different time availability. Amen. And the Holy Ghost knows what's a proper prayer supply for you. I can't tell you that. You couldn't tell me that. You know, if I told you how much I prayed to every day and as a general flow, you couldn't judge that as right or wrong. Or how would you know? I couldn't do that for you. But I know in my, I know in my heart, because I know the Holy Ghost on some, on, on some level, a growing level, whether I'm behind in prayer or whether I'm keeping pace in prayer. Right. And you ought to be able to know that too, pretty readily, sitting right there. Are you behind in prayer, or are you keeping pace in prayer? Amen. And this is giving you insight. How come the Amalekites of my life are prevailing against me? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. We looked at this before, but we're looking at it again. Paul makes this statement in prison. He's writing to partners. He's already called them partners in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, there, uh, a church has been raised up there through the efforts, through what God's done through His ministry. The church at Philippi existed because a man named Paul came at the leading of the Lord, preached evangelistic messages, faced opposition, got people born again. He got them together, started a Christian community, set a pastor over them. Amen. They're spiritual sons and daughters to Paul. 
Now notice what this says in verse 19. Paul says, for I know that this shall turn. He said, I know it shall turn. But what is so inspirational to me, what's, I guess, uh, insightful to me is the better word, is what he did not say next. He did not say, I know this will turn because I have a strong prayer life. He didn't, he didn't point to his prayer life as to the thing that was going to cause this thing to turn. He said, I know that this will turn to my salvation or deliverance. Amen. Through your prayer. Come on. Through your prayer. And through the supply, Amplified says, a bountiful, abundant supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Those two are connected you want to know how to win when it looks like you're going to lose? Get a bountiful, abundant supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ on your situation. <laughs> how do I do that? Through prayer. Through prayer. Through prayer. Now you got to know, right, that Paul's praying. you got to know he's praying. Amen. Here, here's what I want us to see. Because this, this whole thing about prayer is not just about getting your situations turned. But God wants to quickly elevate your prayer life to a much bigger scale and, and to a much more important role. And that is God's got a plan for this generation right now. There's a move to be had. There's an outpouring of the Spirit to be enjoyed. There are souls hanging in the balance. God, I know, sees whole cities, whole towns, whole counties coming to God in this era, in this revival. Glorious healings. Notable miracles. Eternities being altered and changed. Destinies being altered and changed. You think Satan is not going to... You think he's just going to watch bonbons and eat ice cream while that God is moving forward? No, there is resistance. There's opposition in the realm of the Spirit. Amen? And the ones, just like here in this day, the ones that are taking the brunt of that are the leaders, are the generals are the fivefold ministers. Now notice, Paul did not say this is going to turn out because I know God's good and He's for me. God is good and He is for me. Right? And He's, for, he's good and He's for you. Paul did not say again that this is going to turn because of my faith and my prayer life. He said, I know this is going to turn because I know what I have in you. I have a people who loves me enough to bring a supply of the Spirit to my situation Amen. through prayer. Go back over to Acts chapter 12. And let's show you, show you the good side and the negative side of this coin. Acts chapter 12. Y'all with me? Yes. Y'all right? Praise God. Mm -mm -mm. You know, as a leader of this church, now I'm not saying I am, I'm not saying I feel that way, but I don't want to be erring on the hill by myself with nobody to hold my hands up. Come on. I need you, church. Come on. We got a county to win. We got a region to affect. We got a message to preach. We got people to help. Hallelujah. Amen. So, verse number one, it says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain in the church. And he killed James... The brother of John, you know the, the sons of thunder? Yeah. One of the twelve, two of the twelve? Ja this James, he thrust through with the sword. Herod represents the devil here. Who's he yielding to? Now you telling me Herod's not my problem? He sure looks like my problem. No, there's a spirit. There's a demonic spirit behind Herod, influencing Herod, wanting to use Herod. Herod is yielding to this spirit of murder, hatred towards the church. He's being used as an agent of darkness. Amen? 
Now, we don't know at this point in the chronicle, in this point in the account, how come the devil was able to take out this man of God. We don't know, but we get a clue if we keep reading. Amen. And you may have heard this before, but let it sink into you in a new way. It says, in verse 3, And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. He thought, oh, that worked real good. My, pop, my, my popularity poll went up five points. Let's grab Peter. And Peter's only saving grace here is that he arrested him on the eve of Passover. You know, and murder's not a kosher thing on Passover. So they held him. He ordered him held in the prison with the intention to kill him after Passover's over. Right? Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but... Come on, somebody. But prayer was made. Now, your New King James says constant, right? Constant. You know, if you think, I've got a prayer life, I pray over every meal. Well, thank God you do, that's scriptural. But you're pretty elementary in the prayer life if that's all you do. You know, Father, bless me, my four, no more. You know, that's how people used to pray. Yeah. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer, constant prayer, was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord showed up. And came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, slapped him, said, Get up. Now, how peaceful can you be? I don't know what's keeping you awake at night. He's facing execution, and the angel had to slap him. That's the kind of peace you can walk in. Come on, somebody. And raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. How many people have chains on them that could fall off if the church would just pray? Instead of judging them, how come they're not free? Right? If the church would just pray. And so uh, the chains fell off. The angel said to him, gird yourself, bind up your sandals. So he did, get dressed. He sent him out and the gate went out of its own accord and he got away. And so he immediately went to Rhoda's house where they're having a prayer meeting. (laughs) For him. And he knocks on the door. And they wouldn't let him in. No way, no stinking way. It's amazing how people can be praying for a certain thing. God gives it to them and they won't. They're like, no way. (laughs) Instead of like, yeah, it's what I thought. Amen. Amen. They thought they saw Peter's ghost out there. (laughs) Amen. Now, how come James to be killed and Peter to be delivered? Peter's the chosen one. God loves Peter more than James? What's the variable here? Constant prayer. At the time James was taken, the church in its prayer life was absent from the arena as it relates to praying for their man of God. But that woke them up. And when they took Peter, they got with it. And isn't it interesting that when they took Peter, they knew what to do. They weren't doing it, but they knew what to do. They did when Peter they didn't go appeal to Caesar. They didn't get picket signs and go protest. They didn't light up Twitter with a bunch of complaints. What did they do? They called a prayer meeting. They appealed to God. Listen, how do you turn things? How do you turn things? 
Go to James chapter 5. The way you turn things is that you pray. It's real simple. But see, I'm betting that you're a little bit like me. In the sense that when trouble comes, and when pressure comes, your strong inclination and bent is to go do something in the natural. To be active in the natural. To do something in the flesh. Because that's how, we've, that's how we're trained. Things get done. Things get done because I do something. We've got to retrain ourselves that when pressure comes, when trials come, when trouble comes, that we don't step out of the Spirit to get in the flesh. Amen. But we keep that thing in the arena of the Spirit. We win when we're in the Spirit. When we step out of the flat, into the flesh, into the natural, into the carnal is what I mean. Then you're living like mere men. And you lose in that arena. The devil's got the upper hand and the leverage in the natural. But you've got to hold those trials, those tests, those situations in the Spirit. And if you'll hold them there and keep it there and stay in the faith arena, stay in the prayer arena, stay in the authority arena, keep your armor on and use it, you win every time. You win every time. James chapter 5, verse 13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Now in the Greek it says, Is anyone among you going through a test or trial? Okay? Is anyone among you going through a test or trial? What does he say do? You know what? Most Christians, they read that, they read that as uh, call the pastor for counseling. In the modern church, counseling has replaced prayer. And to be honest with you, as much as I have learned, most of the time, I don't know what you should do. No idea what you should do. But I can still help you. Amen. Right? I can point you to the having place. You remember that from last week? What the Holy Ghost said to us about go to the having place. Come boldly before the throne of God that you might obtain. The throne is the having place. Amen. But people come to my office for me to give them their answer because they don't want to do themselves what I would have to do to give them their answer, which is to go before God and get it. Go bo- and that's why the vast majority of Christians, they do not have revelation for themselves about what God's plan is for them. Because they haven't spent any time in the heaven place. You understand this, that there are no questions in the realm of the Spirit. There are no unanswered questions at the throne. Only answers. If you're living confused... Or you're living your life by trial and error. Like, you you know, so many Christians, they're like a a pool table, a billiard ball on a pool table. They just go. That ball just goes the direction it's struck in. I'm struck over here, so I'm headed this way. Then I get hit over here, so I'm bouncing this way. For some people, it's marriage to marriage. For some people, it's church to church. Loan to loan, financial problem to financial problem, sickness to sickness. God's not the author of confusion. Are you with me? (laughs) James said, is anyone going through a test or trial? Let them pray. Let them pray. Now pray how? Pray how? Primarily, go to 1 Corinthians 14. This is going to be done in the Spirit. You're going to pray in other tongues. I don't believe in that. That's your problem. That's your problem, not my problem. Well, am I going to go to heaven even though I don't pray in tongues? Of course you are. Tongues don't get you to heaven. 
The blood of Jesus gets you to heaven. But you're going to experience some unnecessary hell down here on earth because you can't tap into this benefit. Come on. Now, Paul says, I thank God I pray in tongues more than you all. I think that's in what, the 8th verse? No. It's in there somewhere. 1 Corinthians 14, what did you say, verse 18? Yeah, I, I knew it was 8 in there somewhere. I thank my God, he said, I speak with tongues more than y'all. I want to be like the Apostle Paul. We're going to have to talk in tongues then. I have to talk in tongues then. I know they didn't bring that up in this little movie. They didn't have the guts to bring up that in their movie. Great movie, by the way, but they just didn't bring that up. Amen. Now, notice verse number two. Verse number two, talking about how to turn things. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but who? I don't understand what I'm saying in tongues. You're not talking to yourself, are you? No. You're talking to God. Amen. If you have questions about that, you need to go get my little blue book. Amen? Uh, but it says, For no man understandeth him, how be it in, see, in the Spirit. In the Spirit, he speaks mysteries or divine secrets. Mm -hmm. Here's what you do. You're facing something. Things are going the wrong way. You're, there's opposition. You say, now, Father, I, I know prayer's my answer. And my fellowship with you is my answer. I'm here in the having place. And Holy Spirit, concerning you fill in the blank, concerning my unpaid bills, concerning my wayward children, concerning this question, where should I go to church? This, who should I marry? What, whatever this is, right? This disease. Oh, glory. I hold this before you. Now, Holy Spirit, give me utterance. And then you yield. He knows. He's the helper. As the Holy Spirit is the helper, He is content to let you tell Him what the prayer agenda is. Amen? Now, there are times the Holy Ghost would love, would you please pray for so-and-so? Would you, you'll have a burden, a leading. Would you please intercede for this one or that one or pray for this one or that one or pray this thing or that thing? Amen? And you ought to do it. But concerning your life, He's the helper, not the doer. He will help you. So I say, Holy Spirit, concerning the unfinished building and the mountains and the obstacles, I, I ask you, to, I need to pray this thing out. I need to turn it. I need a supply of the Spirit to be brought to it. Because I'm not big enough. God is big enough. And I just take off, and I'm focused on my spirit. I'm not focused on the problem. He knows what I've asked him. He knows what we're praying about. Now I'm just yielding. I'm speaking the utterance. And I'm, I'm focused on my spirit. And if you'll do that long enough, if you need to know something about that situation, that knowledge will come to you while you're praying in the, in the spirit about it. Amen. Amen. Not while you're watching TV. We would all have it made, right, if our revelation came during our favorite episode of whatever it is you like to watch. Right. The Holy Ghost was poured out in Acts chapter 2 while they were praying. God filled them with the Spirit again in Acts chapter 4 and shook the building and did signs and wonders while they were praying. Amen. Amen. Peter was delivered out of prison in the book of Acts chapter 12 while the people were praying. The lame man at the gate, beautiful, was healed while they were on their way to go pray. Almost every significant miracle, supernatural act in the book of Acts can prayers right there somewhere mentioned. We think we can have all that and not pray. We're deceived. We are deceived. Amen. So you just hold that up and you hold that before God and you quiet your mind. Amen. And a lot of times God, concerning that, I never heard from God. 
He never did, he never did speak to me about it. Never. Mm-hmm. What happened then? The situation just turned. I couldn't tell you how it turned. I know why it turned, but I just don't know how it turned. Amen? Evidently, I need, I, he didn't need to speak to me about it, but just through bringing that supply of the Spirit to that situation, God turned it. Amen. How come He just won't turn it? Because you've got to play a part in your own deliverance. That's right. You really want your family saved and your family blessed and your children saved and your children blessed, you need to have some skin in the game. Yeah. 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 And prayer is your part. Prayer is our part. Let me, let me close here if I can. There's a lot behind the scenes with it just going on. I, I'm trying to figure myself out, to be honest with you, in some areas. Amen. And um, I'm finding myself awake when I normally should be sleeping. <laughs> uh, and just different things. And I am praying more. I am praying more. And uh, last night was one of those nights. And was like, what are you doing? I'm awake. I'm getting up. And I spend about 45 minutes with the Lord. Why am I awake? <laughs> what is going on with me? Right. And, uh, well, he did speak to me. I don't mean with an audible voice, but I just hear him on the inside of my heart here. Mm-hmm. Down in my spirit. Not in my head and not from the outside in. Just down in here. That's where your spirit is. Anyway. And uh, he said... Uh, he said, Chris, you know, don't you, that for the last several years that you've been, now I'm going to use the word room. And by that, I just simply mean a place in the spirit, a place of emphasis in my spiritual life that he called a room. You've been in a room of revelation for the last several years, don't you? I said, yeah, you ministered to me about that multiple times. Prophesied that to me through other ministers. I've experienced it. Man, I've had light come to me. Yes, I understand that. He said, but don't you remember I talked to you through Pastor Nancy in Clarksville just a few months ago? I said, yes, sir. And uh, so I have it here. And uh, she said, uh, this is the Spirit of God. She called me out. I was in a meeting. And she said, now I thank you, Father. This is interesting. The refreshing of faith. The refreshing of faith. And the refreshing will take you, talking to me, to the next level. We thank you for it, Father. And with that refreshing is greater revelation. So he's still talking to me about revelation. For the last five or six years, almost every significant prophecy I have from my spiritual parents has something to do with light, Mm -hmm. understanding, revelation. And, uh, And then she said, And I thank you, Father, for a door of revelation, again, open. Yeah, I see that, Father. Thank you. Uh... Open unto him, me, that moves him, me, into another room of utterance. Now, what's he mean? I've been in a room of revelation. I study the word, I pray, and insight comes to me about the plan of God. It should come to you too. This doesn't happen to me because I'm special because I'm a minister. It's just where I've been at, what he's been emphasizing with me for the last several years. Now, interesting, I'm in a room of revelation. It would, it would make sense that the door out of that room is a door of revelation into a different place of emphasis of utterance. Utterance would be prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Now, listen to this. And in that room, Father, she says, in that room is provision, wisdom, healings, miracles, and something else that's private. Think about that. What is the Spirit saying to me? That in this new emphasis of prayer, there are things connected to it. Evidently, my money's connected to it. Mm -hmm. Wisdom's connected to it. That makes sense. Healings. People's healings. Not mine. People's healings through me and, you know, Him through me and my ministry. Healings. Miracles. And something else, private. Mm -hmm. I'm not reading any of that to boast about me. I'm trying to express my heart to you that what's 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 God dealing with your pastor about right now? If maybe in more than praying, Mm -hmm. praying, and if you're smart and you're with me in this family, in this spiritual family, 
you should let that be your emphasis however you can. And grab hold with me. Amen. Grab hold with me. Yes. Because everything that's attached it is, uh, some of it's for me, but most of it's for others. Right? Amen. We need what's attached. But there's a room of utterance. You don't need to wait for the Holy Ghost to call you out in a meeting that you could just step into in your life. Your prayer room is your room of utterance. And there's things connected with that. That's what I want to close with, share my heart. You could see how in Peter's life, with Moses, with Paul, with Jesus. Jesus did not go to Gethsemane by himself, did he? He ended up overcoming by himself. It was harder than it had to be in that moment. Because Peter and James and John were sleepy. Isn't that right? He didn't come to that place of prayer alone. And he didn't bring them for moral support. He brought them to bring a supply of the Spirit. So that he would not turn in the hardest moment from the plan and purpose of God. Don't you ever criticize a minister when you see them fall and turn from the purpose and plan of God, especially if you didn't pray for them. I'm convinced many ministers fail to grab hold of the plan and purposes of God, not because they're not praying, but because the people they're ministering to refuse to pray for them. I'm going to say 1941, I think it was. I could be a little bit off in the story, but this is my closing thought. In around 1941, pre-World War uh, I, II, World War II, Kenneth Hagin, a pastor, country pastor in, down in Texas, unknown, unfamous, unknown, he just had this knowing in his own experience. We don't have what we should have in our churches. I don't have what I should have in my church. We have a little bit of tongues and interpretation. We have some prophecy. We have hardly any of the revelation gifts. We don't have any, very little, of the working of miracles, the power gifts, the supernatural demonstrations of God. How come? He didn't get a leading from God. He just went and started talking to God about it. And it's just so interesting. I'm not Him, okay? I am not Him. Don't want to be Him. Don't compare me to Him. But I feel like a little bit that I'm like where He was in 1941. Mm -hmm. In this sense... He would find himself awake and come into the living room, pray for about 45 minutes. He said, now, I, Father, I, I, it just seems to me we ought to have, have more. We ought to, there's a move. We should have miracles. We should have this. And I, I prayed all about it. I know and pray about it in my own language. I, Holy Spirit, help me. And he would just pray in tongues for about 45 minutes, go back to bed. He did that for three or four months. Then he had this experience I won't take time to tell you about. He prayed in tongues for about four hours, five hours in a row one night, caught up in the Spirit praying about this. And all of a sudden, revelation came. And he got that word. He said, right after World War II, there's going to come a healing revival to America. You know what came to pass? All you have to do is read history. It came to pass. Amen. And so this uh, generation, a few years later, his generation enjoyed a wave. An outpouring, a revival. Yes. In the land. He said, I found out later, I wasn't the only one praying. I wasn't the only one stirred up about that. Amen. He said, I found out many others were praying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. In that sense, I can identify. Because there's a move to be had. Yes, mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And it could be lost to this generation if we don't bring a supply of the Spirit to it. And so that's, I'm praying into that. And I'm inviting you to help me. Amen. And pray into that with me. Amen. Yeah. Because there's a lot connected to it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to have to pay a price to do it, though. You're going to have to pay a price to do it. You're going to have to say no to some other distractions and some other priorities and some other things.
Hallelujah. Give yourself time to that activity. Praise God. My childhood pastor, you could stand on your feet if you like. Stretch your legs. We're about to go. My childhood pastor, I was there at his retirement party. And he made this statement, made me sad. I wasn't in the ministry then. He said, you know, pastoring has been the loneliest thing I have ever done. The loneliest thing I've ever done. And I thought... Because I had an inkling I would pastor at least for a time, and now I have. And I thought, it's not going to be that way for me. But having pastored 17 years, I understand what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. doesn't have to be bad. He wasn't complaining. Right. But think about a literal shepherd and his herd of sheep. Mm-hmm. In that moment, there ain't nobody else like him. Right. How's, this, how's that sheep going to know what it's like to be a shepherd? In that moment, he's by right? right? Paul is saying, the only way this thing's going to turn is if you have enough love and care for me to bring a supply of the Spirit to me. Because he already told, he tells them later in that chapter, in that, not in that chapter, but in that letter. If I had my way, come on, I talked about this, I've already, I'd like to go home. I'd like to go home. Because to go home and be with Christ, that's far better for me. Yeah. Right. But he said, I know if I stayed, I could be a help. I could be a blessing. Yes. And you really, I, what I believe is that the outcome of that was not up to him. And it wasn't going to be up to God. Right. It was going to be up to the church at Philippi. Mm-hmm. Whether or not they would bring a supply of the Spirit Amen. to him. I want you to see as you go home, we are connected. Paul was not kidding. The Holy Ghost was not kidding when he says, like every member of the body, we're up one, we're connected. You know, this thumb is not this thumb. They have, unless they, right? But if this one gets severed, my whole being is going to know it and feel the effect of it. Amen? That's why if I don't pray properly as a pastor it's going to have an effect on you in a negative way because we're connected. But the same is true, friend. That if you all don't pray for me, I'm going to be affected. I don't determine the outcome, what this church becomes, and what it accomplishes by myself. We're connected together. Amen. 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 And I love that. I appreciate that. We're, we're so vitally important, every one of us. So if you pray for me five minutes a day or 30 seconds, I appreciate it. I want to tell you I thank you and I appreciate it and I want more of it. Amen? All right, I've talked enough. Father, we thank you so much for stirring us this direction. There's so much hanging in the balance for this generation of Americans and really just human beings on this planet right now. Will we have the era and its fullness? Will we have the revival that's been prophesied about and talked about in our generation? Or will God have to raise up another? Will the Lord have to tarry His coming yet again? Lord, I know that we have a part to play. Father, we hunger and we thirst for You, for Your will, and for your plan. We unite together in prayer as we leave in one accord and one heart and one mind, asking you, Father, that we would have our part in the era that we're in, that God, that we we just ask for the rain to fall, the early and the latter rain together, not just on us, but on the whole body of Christ around the world. May your will and plan come to fruition. May the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the provision, the wisdom, the healings that you have ordained to be brought to pass, we ask for them. We call for them. With our faith, we believe we receive them. In the mighty, mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you for the grace.
coming upon this place in a new way and everyone in it to pray. The grace to pray. The grace to get up off the couch and turn the TV off and go pray. I thank you for that. Coming upon each member of this church in a new and a fresh way. Bless us. Bless us with safety, with a divine protection. We call you our refuge and our fortress. Thank you for keeping them by your power in every arena as we depart. We just so thank you, Father, for tomorrow and all that is to come. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's my sermon. And as Dr. Summerall used to say, let my fruit remain. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed tonight.